Well, thank you very much, David, for that uh, in introduction, and thank you very much, Your Honours, for attending this evening, and thank you, everyone who's come along today to uh, hear this talk. Now, uh, it is... You have in front of you the original Samuel Holland map, and uh, you might think that we don't need to look at it under the magnifying glass, but in fact, uh, although you can see much of the map, uh, even from the three or four feet in front of it, there is a lot of detail on that map that you will not be able to see, uh, except if you looked at it under a magnifying glass. I'm also going to look at other aspects of, uh, of Holland's uh, map and survey and examine it in considerable detail. And this is something that has never been done before, and it's only um, in the last few years. Uh, I first saw this map in 2007 in the British National Archives, and I think I've seen it about five times since. And I had an opportunity uh, in the early visits to photograph up close, as close as you would like, uh, parts of the map. So I want to uh, discuss with you this evening uh, the map and bring many different aspects of it to light tonight. So we're starting a half hour late, but can you hear me? I, I find that I'm getting a better, if I, is that too close or, yeah. That's, that's fine. Well, uh, this is the first time I have ever spoken in a room which has, bears my name, by the way. It's called the Sobe Gallery. <laughs> and uh, I'm quite pleased to be able to do that because in the United Kingdom, whenever I say my, word, uh, my name, no matter where I am, I automatically spell it because it, if I don't, it will be taken as Selby, S-E-L-B-Y. So I, I automatically say Sobey, S-O-B-E-Y. Over here, I don't need to do that because my name is on practically every, um, uh, you know, every supermarket in the, the country. Uh, in England, it's only found in one little corner of the country, and that's Cornwall. And the Sobeys of the store, uh, I have no direct connection other than uh, sharing the name and an ancestry in England, although they did host uh, a world conference of Sobeys uh, uh, seven or eight years ago on the 100th anniversary. So I finally got to meet the, the Sobeys of Stellarton. So that, it is a pleasure to, uh, to address you tonight, not on the Sobeys, but on Samuel Holland and his survey. Uh, what, I'll give you some uh, idea of what we are going, what I'm going to be talking about. The large map you see in front of you, finally, uh, after 250 years, has come back to Prince Edward Island, as you know, for the first time. I'm going to look at uh, some of its detail and cartographic quality, uh, which you can see some aspects of it from a distance. Uh, the calligraphy, the, the way things are written on it and the style of the labels, the accuracy, no one uh, within, I don't think anyone has before looked at the map in terms of its accuracy. We'll look at that. I'm going to analyze some of the information uh, that is on the map, uh, especially what the map tells us about the, the French uh, settlement, the French houses and clearances when Holland was and, uh, on the island at that time, and I'll explain that later. Uh, there was a major forest fire in the northeast, which I'll discuss, and I'm going to look at a few aspects of Holland's written report, which is partly on the map in the form of a table, which he also presented as a written report, and also he, he wrote uh, an account, which he was required to write, and some aspects of the quality and accuracy of that. I, before I do that, I think you should be introduced to the survey field methods that, uh, very briefly, uh, that, were, that created the map that is behind me there. And uh, it was, uh, uh, as you see there, involving fairly standard survey equipment, a tripod holding a circumferenter, as it was called then, or a compass, surveyor's compass, 
and a chain was required. And uh, the procedure uh, also, also used was another instrument, which you can see on the screen there, and enlarged a plain table, uh, which is uh, also a surveyor's Im implement, involving a sighting line and a table on which you can draw uh, a map already in formation, uh, looking through sites. And uh, uh, so that was also used by Samuel Holland. We're, we're lucky that we have the, the one of the field books that belonged to this survey, there must have been many field books, but only one has survived, and that is of the one of Thomas Wright, who became later, he was a 22 year old at the time. Uh, he later became Surveyor General of Prince Edward Island, and for that reason, his uh, book has remained on the island, and it's only for part of the survey that he participated in. I'll, uh, that is from West Point up around the north of the island all the way towards Rustico. But this is how the survey worked. You can see on his sketch there, and this is his actual field book, I've put in the points of land, West Cape, West Point, Cape Wolf. And so uh, if we enlarge it, you had uh, each of these points on the map is called a station. You had the man with the compass, and also a flagman or a rod man, as he was called in those days. And they could be any distance apart, perhaps a quarter mile, and between them would be two chain men who would chain with a 66 foot chain. And we have one behind me in the exhibit. So uh, that's basically, they went all around the island with a chain, a compass, a rod man, and a chain up every estuary recording uh, on, uh, in his field book the distances and the bearings, and that all had to be put together as the map you see behind me, which uh, probably took, you can imagine, uh, 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 several weeks, if not months. I, I'm not sure how much uh, work. You will appreciate some of the work that went into it as we proceed this evening. Uh, the map, this is the map as I saw it, uh, in London in 2007, uh, it was, uh, you could not lay it out uh, as it is in front of you here. You could only, uh, no table was big enough, as you can see, to hold such a map. So it was like a scroll, and you could look at bits of it at a time, perhaps half the map or, uh, or less. And uh, since then, it has been uh, restored. As we heard, this is the condition of the map, but this is a, a, a showing the sections of paper of which it was constructed. This is uh, before it was restored, and we heard all about its restoration uh, three weeks ago from uh, uh, Lucy, the, the uh, restorer who was involved in it. And you can see it's composed of 16 large sheets of paper and small sheets at the top to accommodate North Cape. But you will, uh, uh, and you might see the joins. I, in fact, I think I can see them from, from where I am here. Now, move on. <laughs> yes, I just want to, and, and for this I can look at the, the actual map. The, the, uh, on the, the map itself, uh, there are a lot of, uh, just looking for my pointer, but it doesn't seem to... Oh, yes. There is a lot of extra, if you look at the map now, a lot of extra uh, space. The, the island shape is such that Holland uh, was able to put all of this, including the title uh, and the description of the area that each person was responsible for, all in that area. Now, uh, that uh, also on the screen here... Uh, is, uh, gives the, uh, the title, you'll notice it says, A Plan of the Island of St. John in the Province of Nova Scotia. Uh, Prince Edward Island, called the Island of St. John, was part of Nova Scotia. There were only about 300 people living on the island at the time. Uh, it was simply uh, an appendage. It had been attached to Nova Scotia for, as a result of the Seven Years' War. And Holland was required to, uh, to uh, by the Board of Trade, 
to uh, which he acknowledges uh, up at the top here uh, that uh, he uh, uh, map this whole island. The survey was to begin on Prince Edward Island. And you'll notice that he, in the map, in this corner, he acknowledges each, the contribution of each of his three deputies as well as himself. And that enables us to plot and show where each of the four deputies uh, uh, carried out their particular surveys. So Thomas Wright was responsible for the area from West Cape all the way around to Orby Head, which is, uh, was in Rustico Harbor at the time. Samuel Holland himself was, uh, did the rest of the north coast to East Point. Arthur Robinson from East Point around to Point Prim. And uh, various people, uh, uh, Arthur Robinson, Thomas Wright, and Peter Haldeman uh, from uh, Point Prim, basically, all the way to West Point. And then various people uh, of these three were the leaders of the teams that did the Hillsborough Bay and the uh, rivers uh, uh, around Hillsborough Bay. Now, um, the uh, map contains, uh, uh, and I'll just uh, whiz through these, uh, a scale in this lower left corner, and you can see it on the screen, uh, the uh, scale is given quite clearly, 4,000 feet to the inch. That's a very l large scale for a map, as you can see. I don't think there's been any map, uh, well, perhaps some modern maps, if you put them together, of Prince Edward Island would be that size. He also uh, recorded the latitude and longitude, and you've had a, a, a talk on that earlier, so I won't... Uh, 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 say anything about that, but that also involved considerable work. The upper part of a map uh, consists of tables which he was required to put on the map, which are descriptions of each of the 67 townships into which he divided it. And uh, he included an explanation, as you can see across the top of the townships, and each of the townships was described in terms of its number, quantity of acres, uh, bounds, uh, woods and lands, and so forth. And this was all a requirement from the Board of Trade. Uh, he also uh, had the, the small table in the lower left corner uh, sum, summarize the data for each of the counties and the parishes. Now let's look at the fine detail, and for this uh, you will need to look at the television screen. These are photographs that I took uh, when, uh, in 2007 of the map. And uh, the first one is of Savage Harbor, which is uh, just there. But I, I just want you to uh, look at the, the detail, if you can see it. There is a considerable amount of detail. It's very fine, and you really only can see it uh, when, when close up on the map almost really, some of the names require a magnifying glass in order to be read. The, uh, uh, these are the instruments that were used for uh, drawing the map. Steel drawing pin, pins with uh, ink points and then watercolor, watercolor was applied over the surface. So the, a very fine drawing instruments. And if we look again at Savage Harbor, we'll go back to it and look at the, the detail of the, the, I don't know how well you can see it there, but the watercolor around Savage Harbor, once the, the, the lines had been drawn and constructed from the survey, they've added a blue watercolor to show the edge of the uh, uh, water. It's very difficult. One of the disappointments in seeing the map at this distance in this light is you can't see the colors very clearly, wh which are evident in the, the uh, photograph. And I'm not sure how clear, I'm getting an oblique view of that, so how clear you're getting it there. But also the, the low water mark is uh, uh, shown uh, there by the uh, uh, stippling. You can see the tide would have retreated 
this is the amount of detail in the work. They distinguished between uh, muddy and uh, sandy substrates uh, in Savage Harbor and in most of the harbors uh, and uh, by fine stippling. Uh, if we look at this uh, view, which comes from uh, Dean Point, now probably most of you don't know where Dean Point is, but it's just, uh, it's near Red Point and uh, what's the park down there? Basin Head. Uh, so Basin Head is just up here. And if you look at the, the, the cliffs uh, are shown the, uh, through vertical hatching, so all around the coast, they recorded where there were cliffs and they've been colored in with brown coloring. So uh, a very exact uh, recording of the nature of the, the cliff. And the blue areas on the, uh, on the land are areas of marsh or wetland. This view is at Trachody. And uh, you can see that the sand dunes are shown with uh, black uh, uh, watercolor uh, and uh, it, uh, perhaps individually shown. There are also, uh, on the land, there are the impression of hills, but these are more impressions than, than actual uh, uh, topography. And uh, if we get in closer, you can see the various, well again, I'm just point, pointing there to the low tide mark. You can see also the fathoms uh, in, uh, those numbers refer to fathoms, three fathoms, that's 18 feet depth, so the depth of water at low, low tide and even into the channel beyond the, into the gulf there is shown. And the, the houses uh, are marked uh, by uh, small squares which are then filled in with a red coloring. Uh, there is a windmill shown. Now these would have been left over from the Akkadian uh, period. The Akkadians had been deported uh, six years before Holland arrived. So all of the buildings, the infrastructure was left abandoned for those six years. And it was one of his duties was to record exactly what was there for the purpose of uh, enabling the Board of Trade to determine how valuable the land was for settlement. Even a tiny cross there, which you can see on the slide, perhaps a standing cross, a croix de chemin or wayside cross that occur still to this day in Acadian villages. It's a sort of sad relic of the, the deportation. You know, you're getting uh, a, a, a landscape of, of war, basically. Everyone had been uh, moved uh, forcibly in 1758 and sent back to France. And many of them drowned, as you know, on the way. And th those just show close-ups. Uh, here is a, this is at Stanhope Cove, and uh, a trail shown, winter portage leading to uh, uh, small buildings. This is the detail that is there on this map, but uh, you'd have to look closely uh, to, to see it. and. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, as it stands now, uh, it's difficult to see. But it is on the uh, map behind. You can get much closer on the floor. You're probably already aware, aware of that. And you can actually walk on, the, on this map or a version of it and get very close. And uh, again, the, uh, the, the, the substrate of the, the cove there is shown very uh, carefully. So I'm going to move on a bit here. And uh, the trees, individually, the trees uh, have been, each of these tiny symbols, which are uh, very tiny, has been drawn with a sharp pen and a loop. And it, they're so carefully drawn that uh, 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 they had to draw a loop and then down, and a shadow mark to show the shade of the tree as if the sun was coming from the west. It's just a standard representation of a tree. Uh, but you think of the time that it took to, to draw all of these on the, the map. So the, the detail uh, is uh, very great. Now I'm just showing you 
uh, another map uh, uh, made just uh, perhaps uh, 10 years before, it's quite a uh, famous map, the Royal Military Survey map of Scotland, 1747 to 1755, just to show that uh, a certain level of, um, a, there, there is similarity in the, the symbols. These maps don't have any uh, code uh, or key for their interpretation. It wasn't done at that time. And, uh, uh, but the same symbolism is used, the red for the buildings, the trees are drawn in the same way. And uh, so Holland and his surveyors would have been trained in this uh, uh, tradition. I've just put that one on because uh, it, it's Aberdeen where I uh, went to the university and I more or less recognize all of the streets there, although the city has expanded around it. But uh, uh, so Holland's map was not unique. The scale of this map is even larger. It's one inch to 3,000 feet. And I was in the British Library by chance when someone had taken it out or had it on a table and it's a huge, it would fill the whole space that the audience is in tonight. Uh, so, looking at, uh, moving on then, so I, I realize that you, uh, many of you can't see the detail that is on the screen. You may as well be standing uh, in front of the map and trying to read it from a distance, but um, uh, it is there uh, and is very, uh, involved a great deal of work and a very precise mapping of Prince Edward Island at a level that uh, was not to occur for many years after. Uh, it's, it's the writing style of the, uh, the map. You can get an idea of that from the large map in front of me, first of all, in terms of the hierarchy of labeling. Uh, if you see, the, the names of the counties are the largest of all. Uh, the numbers of the lots are almost as large as the counties, and then the parish uh, names. Now these were civil parishes, they don't imply a church or anything. In England, parishes are civil divisions as well as uh, ancient religious divisions. And uh, the hierarchy of naming of these and even uh, the, the, the labeling of the uh, various parts of the map's title and all of this uh, is, uh, is very precise and carefully done. If you look at on the screen, you can see just the, the level of, uh, or hierarchies of labels, Princetown lot, this is a, a close up of the Princetown part of the map, which you can see Princetown here from where I'm uh, standing. But the other details, uh, uh, at a lower level, you've got Darnley Basin and March Water, and then um, Cape Aylesbury is shown in a different writing style uh, with small letters as opposed to capitals. And finally, uh, you've got a smaller ones for uh, the sand, uh, 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 I think it's Billhook Sand, and even smaller for the fishery, which I'll enlarge in the next screen here. Uh, and th this is very tiny writing, greatly enlarged on the screen, and it's an island in, in um, Hog Island today. Uh, so the, the uh, and here, Harris Bay, by the French Grand Rustico, well, Harris Bay is written larger and in uh, uppercase letters. Grand Rustico uh, in uh, um, uh, small case letters. And uh, then in a sort of script, you've got by the French. So it's all very hierarchical and, uh, and planned how the labels applied. And then Oyster Banks is written in an even smaller writing. Well, let's move on to consider the accuracy of the map. And I'm going to look at the accuracy in terms of comparing measurements on this map with the measurements on the ground today, basically. How accurate is this map? And no one has, uh, as far as I know, no one has attempted to assess its accuracy. So I'll be comparing long distances, that is lengthy distances on this map, and I'll explain how, how I did it. Uh, shorter distances also compared with the, the modern uh, uh, computer map of Prince Edward Island, the GIS map. And I, I've looked at the coastline shape all around the island and compared it with 
the coast uh, as it is today and in Meacham's Atlas, and also bearing in mind that there will have been erosion in the 200 years. And uh, also uh, another way of assessing its accuracy is to look at Holland's estimates of the township areas. He, on this map, he constructed uh, the bounds of 67 townships. This was purely a map exercise. The, 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 bound, the boundary of the island had been mapped and he came along with his ruler and set square and uh, uh, measurements of what approximately was 20,000 acres and set them out on the map and he estimated then the size of the area on the paper in relation to uh, the, his, uh, his standard. And so he will compare what he considered to be his estimates with what they actually are on the ground today to see how accurate he got it. The, I, I've done this through um, the long distance uh, by using digital photos of this, this map before restoration. The, the Pettigrew facsimile, there is a facsimile of this map in Ottawa which was made in 1931 for the Public Archives of Canada. It's an exact copy and in some ways it's, uh, it's a, better, uh, in be a better state in terms of uh, taking measurements upon it and certainly before restoration. And a digital photo of the uh, 1773 printed version of the map. There were printed versions from 1773 onward which were very accurate but we'll I'll, I'll look at uh, using them as measurements. Now, if you can see, uh, uh, there, I, there are lines on the screen here. Uh, I took long distance measurements. I measured the distance from, from uh, East Point to uh, West Cape and others. So the result was as follows. Now, the percentage error in this map before restoration, and it may still be quite high, was 8.7%. Uh, that was with, uh, with 12 long distance measurements. So it was eight, nine miles out in 100. That's rather a large amount by our standards. And I think, in fact, uh, the reason that that is so is that this map, as you see it even today, involves gaps and uh, overlaps and certainly did before it was restored and also it could not be laid flat so the photograph that I was using had ridges in it so I wasn't surprised that the the error was quite large on the Pettigrew copy however it was considerably reduced and those are the same measurements distances between distant points on the island the error there was about 2.7%, three, three miles. So that is likely a more, uh, a better indicator of the accuracy of Holland's survey, uh, about three miles. In fact, the, the, the great map of Scotland, the military survey, is about, has about the same level of error, 2% over the, the distance of Scotland. So uh, uh, it was what you could expect in maps of that, that day. And that was a high level of accuracy compared to maps previous to that. On the, um, uh, one of the printed versions, the same almost identical level of accuracy, 2.5% uh, error. So two and a half miles in a hundred mile distance. That's pretty accurate for, for its day. Now the second test was shorter distances uh, and these uh, you see on the screen here would be short distances, distances across a harbor or across an isthmus or between points where on the, this, um, I, I was using there the Pettigrew copy in the public archives in Charlottetown, and it's a, um, a derivative of it, uh, and not the, the original. Uh, and the, the results are as follows for it. All of the teams, uh, the error was about 3.6%. 45 measurements, so three to four miles in 100 miles. Thomas Wright, this is like assessing students' work, which I did for many years. 
he gets a score, his error was greater, 4.3%, uh, 17 uh, measurements I took there. Samuel Holland, 3.1% uh, error. Arthur Robinson came out particularly well with 2.2% error. And then the, the various people working on the southern shore, 4.6% error. So it varied between the, the surveyors or the part of the coast that was being surveyed. Uh, the measurements that you, you get are in greater error in different sections, whether this is due to the surveyor or the nature of the coast. Uh, now, so that's one aspect, comparing the, the measurements of distance there is another, um, uh, uh, I examined the coastline and found 29 spots, uh, which are shown in the screen here, where there is a discrepancy with the modern coastline. And the, the two E's mark the position of islands which were misplaced on the map. The, the, if you look at the location of the, the red spots, uh, uh, they're more prone between the uh, along the southern shore here, errors or uh, er discrepancies anyway, uh, and a few scattered on the northern shore. Arthur Robinson had no discrepancies again. So uh, again, he's coming out tops. Well, one of the island measurements, you will, you will know the island, Poplar Island, it's just outside of Charlottetown. Uh, you cross it every time you, you come into Charlottetown uh, from the west, and on Holland's map, it has been misplaced. It's in the wrong place. I noticed this because I was on the Upton Farm uh, Land Trust uh, for five years on the board and we were looking at old maps and it became clear that the, the map uh, was in error. Now that's the Upton farmland and there you've got uh, what is uh, now known as Poplar Island shown. You won't, uh, it'll be not visible perhaps in, on the, the large map. And I keep pressing this, but oh yes, here we go. Uh, that's the upland farm uh, uh, showing the location of the island uh, here. And uh, if we look at a, a recent, uh, recent relatively, photograph of the island, 1935 aerial photograph, and you've got the you've got the position of the island shown in Holland's map is shown in the blue there. And the, uh, it's been totally put in the wrong position. This was the responsibility of Peter Haldeman. Uh, for some reason, there's a major error. And uh, it should be where the blue spot is shown there. We know that it hasn't moved by uh, accretion and uh, erosion because we have a, a map that was just made three years later uh, uh, by Charles Morris, the Surveyor General of Nova Scotia, when he surveyed the royalty of Charlottetown, and it's exactly in the position it is in today. So a major mistake in a small island. And if you uh, use uh, Google Earth and plot the ma one map over the other, you can see that they are totally misplaced there. And just running th backwards through it, you can see the two islands uh, overlaying one map as, as best I, I could, you get it, it is in the wrong location. So there are mistakes in the map. Another one is with Holman's Island uh, in Summerside Harbor. Uh, it uh, is uh, farther, uh, shown farther from Summerside than it is on, in reality. And uh, if we measure the distance, if we overlay uh, the Holland map onto a Google Earth map, and you can see the two, uh, if you're, you can see they don't correspond. Uh, the distance uh, on Holland's map is one and a quarter miles, uh, whereas in uh, present day, and this is using not the present day shore, but the equivalent point as it would have been in 1765, is three quarters of a mile. So the error is of the order of 56%, uh, which is very high, you know, it's half a mile out over such a short distance. And so also Indian Point or McCollum's Point. Uh, so there are uh, errors of that sort. Uh, they are more prominent in some parts of the map than on the other. 
the distance, McCollum's point distance, is, is 23% out. Now, so that's one aspect. The, the, there, there are differences in the coastline uh, attributed to some either cartographic or surveying errors. But there's another problem with the map, and this is almost entirely confined to the area that Thomas Wright was responsible for, and that is river estuaries were left out of the map. Uh, it doesn't occur in other parts of the map. So if we look at New London Bay, and this is the New London Bay as it is on the Holland map, and as you see it in front of you there. And if you look at New London Bay as it is in reality, you've got very long river estuaries. And these were required to be surveyed. Each of the, the sub-surveyors, the three of them had signed a statement that they would go up the river as far as the um, uh, compass chain could go and then cross at the point where they could get across with the compass chain. Well, there, uh, if you look at, and this shows the, the Google Earth view of the same area, uh, rivers such as the Southwest River and the Stanley River and uh, Hope River, French River, are not on the map, uh, or just the entrance is shown. The, there are bits of the map. If you cut off, this is more or less what uh, uh, is shown. Uh, and. Uh, That's what's missing. So uh, there's a major cartographic shortcut taking place uh, in that part of the, the map. And so also in, uh, in other examples, Kaskampek, uh, the Kildare River, Mill River, Trout River, Foxley River, all quite substantial river estuaries, as you know, if you've been up that way. And when you look at the, the map, uh, all of these are cut short, and some of them are called coves on the map. Now that would have come later, the naming. They weren't coves at all, they were the mouths of major rivers. And so they've been cut off at, uh, more or less, that creates the image that you would see on the map. Uh, so a large part of the rivers has been left out. Uh, and you can see what is missing there. Now, there is still another major problem with the west of the island. And uh, there is an area, a, a major cartographic problem with the area west of Portage. Now, how many of you have ever been west of Portage? <laughs> well, that's good, about half the audience. Uh, because it's uh, a very important part of the island and uh, it has a serious error in its mapping. Now, you may not have realized this. That's the, that is, just look at this map here as you see it. And does anything look wrong with it? Well, most people, I didn't think there was anything wrong with it initially when I uh, began to uh, look at it, but there is a, there is a, if you look at the lots closely, lot five has a seacoast. Now, Holland created these lots on the map, and they're each to have 20,000 acres. And of course, he didn't uh, see, see these, uh, uh, and there was no mapping on the ground. But if you look at the, uh, the, the maps of the lots today, that just shows the seacoast uh, of lot five on an enlargement of one of the engravings of Holland's map. Well, if you look at uh, the present day, you can see that, you can see that Lot Five has no seacoast, and in fact, the island is much wider. Uh, this is very pinched. Uh, there's a lot of land missing here. Uh, I can calculate how much land is missing. Uh, if you overlay on the the Google Earth, the uh, you can see the two images there. Uh, you can see when the uh, uh, east coast is aligned and uh, I'm just 
That much land is missing from the map when the east coast is aligned. And if you align with North Cape and West Point, well, there will be land missing from both sides. Uh, and it's several, uh, several miles of land is not there on Holland's map. In fact, we can calculate uh, the, the amount of land. It's shown uh, the two maps are overlaid there together. And uh, it's 21,000, almost 22,000 acres of land. Now that's a whole township. If Holland had had that uh, map, as it, if it was correct, we would have had 68 townships and uh, probably uh, more land problems. <laughs> the, the, uh, it's, two point, it's actually 2.9% of the island is missing in this part of the map. And that's just another showing the distances uh, that if you, on Holland's map, 12.7 uh, miles, it's actually 16.6 uh, uh, miles, and north-south there's a, an error as well. So the whole thing is the wrong shape. Now, that may be, may be due to Thomas Wright, but uh, Earl has just mentioned to me recently, Thomas Wright had left possibly before the map was finished, and so his books were being his book that we have could well have been used by another surveyor who di didn't have uh, all of the information. But we have the books and that could be tested and there's a project for someone to take his book and draw the map and see if this is what you get or perhaps you get something closer to, um, to what it is now. But there is a, a major error. Holland and the surveyors were not aware of that. However, Islanders became aware in the 1830s of this error. So it was known because if you owned land in that area and were trying to plot it according to this map, you were going to be in, in, uh, have in some difficulties. And that's exactly what happened. This is uh, uh, not Holland's map, but showing if you're the landlord of lot nine and run your lines in uh, from the points on Holland's map, and if you're the landlord of lot uh, six and run from the other direction, you end up with uh, 5,000 acres of land which overlaps and is in dispute. And this is labeled as such on an 1852 map. In fact, it was so serious that the surveying uh, in the 1840 an act was, uh, the, the Boundary Laws Act was suspended in Western Prince County because these problems were arising. And it, it makes it very clear in the act itself of the legislature, owing to the inaccuracy of the original plan and description of the island, that is Holland's plan, uh, difficulties have lately been in, uh, encountered in fixing the commencement of the boundary lines. So this was known, there was a major error, and they had to suspend all surveying of the townships in the west of the province. And it, well, it took some years, even in the 1850s. Uh, the cartographic correction occurred as a result of another uh, quite, uh, uh, should be well-known cartographer, and that is Captain Henry Bayfield, who was also based in Charlottetown, carrying out a survey of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And this is his map, uh, 1839. And so it became available to land surveyors as well, who produced maps of Prince Edward Island, including George Wright, who uh, was the grandson of Thomas Wright. The surveyor generalship inherited uh, from one to the other, uh, three generations uh, on the island. And if you, the corrections of Bayfield, this is uh, a map produced from Bayfield, a Wright map, and if you overlay it with the Google Earth, you get an almost perfect fit, and also all the estuaries are shown. So uh, I'm just running it back now, and one fits exactly the other like a glove. So a correction occurred in the, the 18 uh, on land maps by the 1850s. So Holland's map then, it was realized there was a major error. However, I want to uh, note that in the eastern end of the island, it's, it's accurate. It does not, uh, the whole east end of the island, you can overlay it with uh, uh, Google Earth and get a uh, uh, quite perfect fit. Uh, so uh, you choose your surveyors. <laughs> I'm sure that happens with modern surveyors as well. They make mistakes. But uh, 
Poland's estimate of the township areas, these are his estimates. The gray represent, he considered, and on paper, they, they would have been such, that most of the townships, 56 of the townships, were exactly 20,000 acres, or pretty close to it. And all of the, the other 10 were larger than that, and they're shown on the map there. So they were all considered to be 20,000 acres or more. And this was important in terms of the land grants that were being shortly to be made. Uh, so the mean township area, the average township area, is 20,334 acres. Uh, the reality on the ground today is somewhat different and we couldn't expect it to be exact, but there are only 26 of the townships within 5% of 20,000 acres, and uh, 28 are in ex greater than 5%, so that 28 townships are larger than Holland thought they were. Uh, 12 uh, townships were smaller by uh, uh, 5%, uh, uh, that is less than 5%, were less than 19,000 acres, and some of these townships, as you can see, there were two less than 18,000 acres. Now, Holland had considered that these were 20,000 acres. These would have implications for the owners of those lands. You, you thought you were getting 20,000 acres in a grant, but you were only getting less than 18,000. But quite a number were also getting in excess. See, the, the GIS measure uh, is then larger. The average uh, township size uh, the measures are done on a, a, a GIS map, uh, was 20,800, and uh, so 474 acres more than Holland's estimate. And the total acreage of the island is, uh, uh, in reality, 29,000 acres more than Holland considered it to be, and that is very similar to the missing land in West Prince. So it may be that uh, that has, has contributed, uh, it, should, it will have contributed to Holland's error. Uh, the analysis of the, the anthropogenic, that's just an elaborate word, the human created the, the uh, infrastructure. I'm just going to give an example of the, the information contained on Holland's map, the, the pre-deportation French settlements. Uh, on the island where all, record, all buildings and all cleared land were recorded by Holland. And uh, part of the, what we've done in the book has been to map and uh, show this in various maps, uh, not at the detail uh, that uh, Holland did, but sort of summary data. This shows the upper Hillsborough River. And if we enlarge that bit and look at it, uh, you can see the, the field bounds, which I have drawn on it, and then you can see the location of the houses. And there is uh, a mill as well. And this then, having plotted these, I transferred these from um, Holland's map to the modern map. In the, uh, and this shows the same general area, a larger part of it. Uh, and you can see the location of where the, the houses uh, of the Acadian population would have been in 1765, the, the remains of the buildings. And this, uh, this is, shows another uh, settlement, the Bedeck uh, settlement. Uh, this is an oblique view, but uh, you, you we're looking at the Bedeck Bay from the east in, in, in the map. Here are the Acadian houses. If we zoom in on uh, one of the, on the Dunk River and uh, mark the houses so that you can see them more, more clearly and then mark the bounds of the, the land, you can if you, uh, well, Holland uh, for this area uh, estimated for each uh, uh, eight houses on the north side and 12 houses on, on the south on his map and at Wilmot too. We can then compare it with a very important census, uh, a French period census of 1752. Now that's six years before the deportation, which is a nominal census. It names all the people who lived in those houses. And the names of the people are named not just the, the parents, 
but also each of the children and their ages. It's one of the, the most uh, rich censuses and all of their farm animals that they possessed and the acres of land they had cleared and the crops they had sown and how many horses, how many cows, of what age even. <laughs> the animals are all aged in terms of their uh, not annual, uh, you know, mature or, or young. And so we can say that in this village, uh, these people, uh, Joseph Robichaud and Jacques uh, Gerdry and so on, the, the Lejeune family especially in those names, and this we can do for all of the, the uh, uh, we can use Holland's, sen uh, Holland's survey to plot La Roque's census. Now, there was a, um, uh, between 1752 and 1758, there was a change in the French population. There were more people coming in, but at least we have the, the sort of uh, baseline of 1752. And uh, so in uh, the, uh, when we plot these, uh, that's just showing the roads. This is what we get for the whole island. Uh, the distribution of the 432 houses and 10 mills, the roads and trails shown over the whole island, each of the houses represented by a dot, and they're concentrated in specific areas. And uh, for, uh, that's a close-up then of the central part of the island. And uh, also, uh, this map then shows the counts of each of the houses uh, the, uh, for each of the villages. So um, you can count the number of dots, but it's showing the same distribution. And uh, it enables us then to plot this census of 1752 with all of the names that La Roque gave to each of the villages. Holland did not know the names of the communities that he was mapping. They were just collections of houses, buildings. But with La Roque's census of 1752, we can also put names to each, of, as, uh, as well as faces, as I said earlier, to these communities. And we can work out the acreage of land. Oh, oh, sorry, this, this is just how, how you can then elaborate the data and look at the changes in the numbers uh, between 1752 and the, the buildings on the same site in 1765, which would represent 1758. The whole thing was left uh, untouched uh, to a degree, or at least this map enables us to see what changes were occurring. In some places, there are fewer houses Holland was counting fewer houses than the rock, which indicates the houses have been destroyed. And they're all near the garrison uh, along the Hillsborough, probably using it for wood, uh, pulling down houses, to, and it, there, it's in the records as well. The amount of cleared land uh, is shown there for each of the townships. And uh, it's just, I'm not going to uh, go over that, but you can, it gives a and a good idea of the concentration of the Acadian settlements before the deportation. So that is part of the information that is contained in Holland's map. Now, you've probably never heard of the great fire or fires in the Northeast, but it's a, a continuous uh, commentary of the British period from Holland in 1765 onward, even up to the mid 19th century, people would comment that a great fire had gone through the northeast and destroyed the whole forest, sometimes saying on the whole island. Well, Holland's map presents the most accurate record of the distribution of that fire. Now, part of the, 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 the record is in his written report, which he had to write as well. And uh, in that, he wrote, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but he described the area that had been burned. And this is one of his descriptions in the, the report. The woods upon the coast from East Point, as far southward as Hillsborough River. So that's East Point at one end to the Hillsborough River, which is here, had been entirely destroyed by a fire about 26 years since. We know the dates of the fire from French records. There were two fires, 1736 and 1742. We don't know which fire caused which damage. In an earlier letter in the spring, uh, six months earlier, Holland gave a slightly different description describing the fire as running from the Bay of Fortune, which is here, all the way to Tracady and almost to Rassico or Rustico. So it's the same general area 
We also have French descriptions of East Point and the North Shore being burned. So, and Holland, in each of his, uh, in his township table, he had a description of the extent of the fire in each of these townships in the Northeast. So, uh, in 2006, I made a, uh, I took into consideration all of that written evidence, and this is the, the distribution that you get of the fire I had worked out. And uh, it's on the, the screen here, but it's basically the whole uh, of the section that I'm outlining from there to there, uh, the whole northeast of the island. It does not mean that all the far forests in that area were burned. Remember the surveyors were traveling along the coast and recording burned wood from the coast. Also hardwood forest was less likely to be burned. The French records say that. But anywhere where there were conifers, uh, there, there was major fire damage, still evident 26 years later. But Holland had also stated something else, and this is in the written report. And uh, this was, a, well, in a, a letter to uh, Lord Hillsborough, who was the president of the Board of Trade, he said, in many places, the fire affords a very extraordinary appearance, particularly at the carrying place betwixt the Northeast Rivers and Trachedy. That's the portage between Trachedy Bay and the Hillsborough, where the burnt timber looks at a distance like lofty pillars or columns. That's a very, you can imagine, pine trees when they had burned, very, these would be old growth uh, pine, very large trees would stand for decades after looking like lofty pillars or columns. Well, that was all very well, but uh, I discovered later when I looked at closely that section on the original map, what did you see? But what looked like lofty pillars or columns. If we enlarge those, the tree symbols differ. They're just drawn as a tiny vertical post with its shadow mark, but a very heavy line. And when I uh, looked at the uh, distribution of these, and uh, uh, where are we going here? Oh yes, I'm going to show you another section where the trees differ. If my computer, if the computer says yes, uh, here you—it's uh, going to jump ahead because I've been pressing it here. But here you see the two types of uh, symbols. Along here, uh, these little burnt columns. Over there, the usual tree symbols. Those are both from the uh, same section of coast. And when you plot. Uh, these uh, on the map and uh, using a computer program I was over, o able to overlay the Holland map on the modern map that shows the plotting of the symbols the e each of the individual symbols along the hills uh, the portage and uh, more widely between St. Peter's Bay you can see them as black uh, St. Peter's Bay to Trachety Bay you'll see a scattering of black tree symbols, and when you plot the, uh, the map for the whole island, and there were 2,326 symbols of burnt trees, they almost correspond exactly with the description of the fire. Now these would have been special or different trees, pine or hemlock, found only in specific parts of the uh, burned area, but they're giving us an indication of the distribution of the trees of these types. Now, nowhere on the map is there a key saying that this is what these symbols mean. Nowhere in the report is there a statement to the effect. So Robinson and Holland went to considerable effort. They were the ones who were responsible for that coast, but they then did not record uh, or to the, for the Board of Trade, not for us in posterity, that this was so. And this is one of the sort of oddities of the survey. All this work was carried out and uh, no mention made of it in Holland's report. Which leads us to the, the, the report itself. And I just want to say uh, so, some uh, points about the... the uh, before I leave the map, the map is, is 
a tremendous achievement. I have, I'm not talking about the legacy of the map, that's in a, totally, a totally different topic, but its accuracy. Uh, I haven't put any maps showing what was before, but uh, you've probably seen them in other talks, and this really does look like Prince Edward Island, and you, you will not be aware of the, the minor anomalies. It's only when I get under the, with the magnifying glass that I'm able to detect the, these errors. So we, we have to credit Holland and his deputies with that achievement. The, the report, uh, Holland was required to uh, uh, produce a map and a report, a written report, to convey a precise knowledge of the actual state of the country, its limits and extent, its latitude and longitude, the nature of its soil and produce, uh, its collieries, that is coal mines, its sea cow and seal fisheries, and its timber resources. So it was to be a full description of the, sort of the economic potential. The principal harbors were to be described, and he was to take soundings along the coast, rivers, and bays, and we've seen those in the, in the map. And uh, this is his written report, the opening paragraph uh, describing St. John's. Uh, and it's uh, divided into various sections, names of the counties and parishes, uh, begins with that. Uh, and then he has various headings, soil and produce, timber, what parts of the island are best situated for trade and fishing with the reasons, reasons for fixing the three principal towns, and uh, birds, beasts, fishes, etc., and the nature and effect of the climate. So it's, a, it's an extensive report, but all of this is done only in nine pages, so it's not very detailed. <laughs> uh, uh, and then an explanation of how the civil divisions were laid out on the map. So this is the content. But I, there are, I just want to, before I end, highlight some sort of major shortcomings in the report and then explain why they occurred. Um, this has sticky buttons. We moved, jumped ahead to the timber, and uh, this is it. Uh, uh, his description is largely a sort of a tree list. Um, red and white oak, beech and maple, very good. Black and white birch, the former of which is a useful and handsome wood. The pine is extremely large and fine. In some places is found the curled maple, which is present-day sugar maple, which takes an excellent polish. Spruces of many different kinds is the universal produce of the whole island, from one of which we get the balsam of Canada, that would be balsam fir, and from the maple uh, you get sugar. It's sort of an antiquarian list of, uh, uh, list of trees and their products, and it's not really very useful in terms of the forest uh, constituents of the island. Uh, and there is no um, uh, white oak on Prince Edward Island, so botanically it's not correct. These were surveyor soldiers uh, with little experience of the trees of the island, I, I would gather, although they, uh, Holland had spent some time in New York State. So it's not really a very good description. You know, if you were to assess it, uh, it would be. Uh, Thomas Curtis, uh, a sawyer, a laborer, uh, at New London gave a far more valuable description about 10 years later of the forest. I think Holland was rushed and uh, well, also it probably didn't have an interest in trees. His uh, township descriptions uh, also if you uh, had to include the quality of the lands and woods in each of the townships on his map. Now the townships only existed on the map, so they would be from presumably notes that the surveyors had kept of the different coastlines. And uh, these are the descriptions for each of the, the townships. And it, uh, for, uh, for a scientist, they are uh, a, a headache. So the wood is either described as very good, this is the woods and lands, very good, good, pretty good, tolerable good, indifferently good, indifferent bad, very bad, or better than lot 22 or whatever. So it's, uh, 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 it is a terrible list. And I can say this uh, even for the time it's a terrible list because I'll come to a correction that Holland made of it. 
When you plot these uh, and grouping them on the, on the island, the black represents very good lands and woods. And the uh, gray represents good, pretty good, or tolerable good. And then white represents very poor. Lot 60, flat rivers, the poorest on the island. Very poor for some reason. No, no obvious reason why. Well, if you look at those, if you put those, uh, if you look at what is considered to be very good land, it would be the worst land on Prince Edward Island today. And if in the next slide, uh, if you look, uh, the green represents forested land today. And any land that is forested today is poor land. Agriculture has cleared and is clearing any upland hardwood soil. So Holland really got it wrong for the Portage Isthmus. Um, it may be the trees, or, uh, it, was, it was Thomas Wright who was doing that part of the survey, but the others uh, uh, in the east. Uh, so, I mean, the, in the book I consider all sorts of reasons why they could make these errors and why the, we, there are mitigating factors to explain this, uh, what they could see from the shore and so forth. But the problem with this is that it uh, uh, was, uh, being used by the Board of Trade to set the, the ta land tax, the quitrent, as it was called. And uh, there was quite a difference in being assessed at six shillings per 100 acres. I've converted these to Canadian dollars in 2015. And if you were assessed at six shillings per 100 acres, that's for your whole 20,000 acre lot per year, you would ha and it's wilderness land undeveloped, you would have to pay $14,000 in taxes on that land. Whereas if you were at two shillings, it would be $4,800. So there's quite, these weren't uh, onerous, uh, 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 these were um, fairly onerous uh, demands if they had been paid, and some landlords did pay them. So uh, Holland uh, and his surveyors didn't get the, uh, the land assessment very uh, correctly. Uh, the fisheries, this is the uh, assessment of the fishery, and all we can say is that quite clearly uh, it was the north shore and the east sh eastern shore which have the black dots which were considered by Holland and it's the cod fishery we're talking about. And I have been talking to Georges Arsenault. Is he here today? Don't think so. That is, uh, cod is not, well, some of you may know, cod is not fished along, or was not fished along the South Shore. So it's a reflection of the, uh, the situation as it was. He notes that in one of the townships there was an established fishery, but he doesn't comment further on it. And that, I would have thought, would be what the Board of Trade wanted to know. Uh, and we learn more from other records of the period on it and, and uh, what was going on there. The, I just want to, uh, 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 he, the section on birds, beasts, fishes, etc. And he, uh, in a very brief sentence, he's actually got a very accurate list of these species. Uh, here are bears, otters, martens, foxes, red, black, and gray, and uh, I'll just carry on. And this is what he recorded. Uh, and this is an, uh, from other recorders of the period, this is an exact list. Uh, this is uh, presumably the Acadian guides who were, you would not expect to see these animals if you walked through the woods, many would be elusive. So I presume the source was uh, his Acadian guides. He also uh, recorded, um, um, caribou, though some very, uh, some, th some, though very few caribou, uh, and uh, there were caribou, woodland caribou on the island in the French period, and it may be that they uh, were still present, but it's possible uh, uh, that they were not. I think it's more than likely that uh, they had become extinct at that stage because uh, uh, he doesn't report the Acadians as feeding on them, if, uh, which they would have done if they were present. So, uh, but people tend to believe animals persist even after their uh, recent extirpation. He makes no mention of the plague vole, um, uh, which presumably the source of any information would have had to been the Acadian settlers, so we have no information 
provide it. And another aspect that sort of verifies his list, he did not record the presence of moose, porcupine, or beaver, and this is confirmed by other lists of the period, the French period records. So Holland gives us a good list of animals on the island. These moose, when they come, they want to stay. <laughs> uh, birds. Uh, this is uh, Holland's bird list, and I'm not going to uh, uh, read it out at all. It's uh, uh, an interesting list, but it has uh, in it a list of uh, birds which you will have never heard in your life uh, of. Moyak, Kakawa, Marshal, Kakawa, Kandarosh, Goyalan, Estelé, Margo, Gode, Sea Pigeons, Penguins. They're either French names or Mi'kma names. Now, when I saw that list in Holland's uh, uh, notes, I immediately recognized that it came from a book. Uh, and the exact list of uh, names has been taken by Holland from a book that was published uh, by, in 1760 uh, by, it was called Genuine Letters and Memoirs Relating to the Natural, Civil, and Commercial History of Cape Breton and St. John, the islands of, by, written by an impartial Frenchman, an anonymous author. In fact, he was so impartial, he shifted to the British side and became a spy. <laughs> uh, we know his name today. It's uh, Thomas Quichon, and he ended his days in Jersey, or Guernsey, uh, on the cha in the Channel Islands, uh, and he is not a reliable recorder. In fact, Holland in his Cape Breton uh, report said, this is not the first, he was writing about something in Cape Breton, not the first time I have been deceived by this impartial Frenchman. Well, <laughs> perhaps he had been deceived in the, in the bird list. Uh, I know what those birds are by going to sort of sources which uh, uh, early French and uh, uh, there are studies which have been carried out, but there, there are various uh, uh, types of eiders and other, other birds. But Pichon had made it clear that they applied to both Cape Breton and the island of St. John. So Holland, rather than going out and doing some bird watching, simply listed uh, what he got from a book. Uh, there, uh, and thus, and some of the other uh, names in the list uh, then become suspect because the phrasing is the same as in the book. So, um, you know, that's called plagiarism nowadays. <laughs> but in those days, perhaps if you're uh, uh, in a distant place and having time, and I assume the map was taking up all their time, the, the, the doves that come in July and August, which are the passenger pigeons, and they definitely occurred, you get that same phrase in um, uh, Pichon. And Corbejo, a kind of woodcock. So he's, he's, he's lifting it from, from a book. Also, unfortunately, his fish list then becomes a bit fishy, so to speak. And uh, a lot of the names, these are the fish in it, uh, just to read it for those who can't read, cod, turbot, halibut, thornback, sturgeon, place, flounders, mackerel, and gaspero, a kind of mackerel but smaller. Uh, in the rivers and lakes are very fine trout, eels, and smelts. How many people have found a lake on Prince Edward Island? Holland didn't find any, there aren't any shown, but he found rivers and lakes in Pichon's book. <laughs> so he, th these uh, are the all of the fish uh, that come from the book. And uh, so I, 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 I'm being facetious about this. The map was the, the, the great achievement. But two scholars have written books from afar who've looked at this and said Holland presented a very accurate report and description. And one of the scholars, uh, the book isn't yet out, said Spruce is the universal produce of Prince Edward Island based on Holland's report, whereas upland hardwood forest is the, the principal uh, tree, or uh, you know, forest type. So from a distance, it may look like Holland's report is, is correct. Um, I'm not taking away from, it's easy for me, I haven't mapped any, even my own property, let alone uh, uh, a bit of Prince Edward Island. But uh, 
that's just showing that what he's copied or what is in the same phrasing from Pichon's book. There was an, uh, another aspect of the report that he was asked to report on, and I, this is just showing four seals to remind me to say something. These are seal species which occur in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and oops, and the walrus as well. And he was asked to report on that. He makes no mention of the seal fishery in his March, less, uh, uh, March letter to the Board of Trade president. He said, I will report later, but he left it out of the final report. So there's no uh, reference to the seal fishery. And what he says of the walrus is interesting. They seldom or never come on shore. And that he says only in the earlier letter. And that is in contradiction to other writers of the 18th century, which describe an active walrus colony in North Cape. We have early maps with the word Eshuri, which is the French name for a walrus hollow. So uh, in the book, I consider there are possibilities. Perhaps the walrus weren't here when Holland uh, in that year. And there was an active uh, fishery, is the word that was used for it, of walrus in the Magdalene Islands. And uh, uh, Haldeman, Peter Haldeman, who, re, uh, who was dispatched to survey the Magdalenes. By the way, the Magdalenes were also surveyed in the same year and are part of the survey of the uh, Holland survey with Haldeman doing that. And he described the walrus fishery there in great detail. So perhaps Holland thought, well, that'll do for uh, the island of St. John as well. But also Haldeman said that when the walrus are disturbed in their, um, their uh, colonies, they often will not come back to the same colony. So perhaps uh, the island was only colonized by, or you know, as a breeding ground with the disturbance occurring in the Magdalenes. I don't know. Well, uh, come along the slide. The, I have been subjecting Holland's map and his report to uh, a sort of very critical analysis. Um, I kind of, uh, uh, his report, uh, uh, to, um, um, I won't try and find his own words. Uh, when you come to his survey of Cape Breton Island a year later, it took slightly longer, he wrote a report on Cape Breton Island. And it's 56 pages long, not eight pages. It has much more detail on the forests. It has such a detail on the forests of Cape Breton Island around the Bordeaux Lakes that modern ecologists have been able to work out the type of forest that was there. It will list all the trees and their sizes. So it will say birch, maple, beech, which means upland hardwood forest with pine of so many feet in diameter. And how did Holland a year later produced such a poor report, whereas a year in Cape Breton. Well, he acquired two new deputies. One was George Spruill, who was a seconded from his regiment at Lewisburg, and he did the entire survey of the inner Bador Lake, and it is he who recorded the forests in great detail. On the outer part of Cape Breton Island, which was surveyed by Wright and uh, Holland himself and another deputy, Pringle, all you get are forests good, forests very good, <laughs> tolerably good, with no list of species. So if you get an expert in the trees, Spruill, he was a young soldier, he went on to become the surveyor general, of, he joined the team, he stayed with Holland's team, and he became the surveyor general of New Brunswick and ended its days in the 1820s. So if you get a, a person who's qualified, uh, you will produce a good report. Now, the second person that Holland acquired in Cape Breton was another uh, man called George, George Derbage. And Holland wrote in his letters to the Board of Trade that he had acquired this man to work on the written parts of the survey and to acquire the information. And he says, this is not something that interests me and I don't have the time for it. So, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> We, had the, we, we were the first part of the survey. It was sort of uh, gearing up uh, uh, the, the four deputies uh, very competently achieved their uh, aim of mapping the island. I think the report got short shrift 
at the end, it was, it was very um, uh, quickly done. Uh, oh, I'll use that book. Copy the birds, copy the animals. I'll leave out the, the walrus. They, they want to, or, or the walrus and the, the seals. But that is not to take. So Holland, Derbych became part of Holland's team. He continued right to the end as his uh, accountant and also as the writer of reports. And the quality of the Cape Breton report is much higher. Well, the quality of the map, no one can argue against the quality of the map. And it has, uh, apart from uh, me poking my nose into it and uh, finding little errors here and there, uh, it uh, is a very good representation of Prince Edward Island. And I hope that in being critical, as what a scientist is supposed to do, I have not uh, uh, led you to underestimate the achievement in, in uh, Holland uh, uh, creating such a map. So I want to thank you for uh, putting up with the delay at the start, and um, uh, I'm willing to answer questions later. So thank you very much.